Greek Prime Minister. Sorry. Greek Prime Minister. Sorry. I'm sorry. That's what happens when you're at the UN. I'm trying to get our producers to run over and catch him. It was extremely nice to get away, uh, even for five or six days. I have to say, part of me felt like I'd like to bury my head in the sand, but I couldn't do that because the only thing, of course, everybody wanted to talk about on my holiday was, guess what? The American election. Actually, it was quite interesting because I had um, Mayor Sadiq Khan of London on one of the US nets just the other, some, I think it was uh, today or yesterday, saying that this, the American election is the most important election of all the elections that are taking place around the world this year. And it was certainly the case while I was on holiday. It's, it's literally the only topic of conversation. That's my sense also around the dinner table. I'm sure that's the case for you as well, Katrina. I mean, it feels like everyone constantly wants to ask who's going to win. And of course, that is the one question that we can't answer. We're not going to answer. Nobody wants to be left with egg on their face. Um, and it's impossible to predict these things anymore in US politics, as we know, despite what the polls may or may not say. But it's great for us three to get together and have this chat as we're doing every week on the run into the election ahead of all being together in the studio on the big results night. We've been talking there about what um, people are saying around the world Sumi, you are at the UNGA in New York. All of the world leaders gathered there. So much power and influence in one place. So what's the tone coming from there? Yeah, well, Katrina, Caddy, you both know this experience very well. You know, you sit here on Press Island. We literally had a situation where President Macron walked by yesterday and I was standing on a box shouting questions down to him, which, of course, he didn't answer. But regardless, all that to say... How rude you know, of him. <laughs> That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Um, but it was really interesting to note, you know, we've been talking to a number of people here this week about obviously the biggest uh, global issues at the moment, which is the escalation in Lebanon between Israel and Hezbollah. Of course, the ongoing war in Gaza, the war in Ukraine, but also trying to get a sense of how people are looking at this mm -hmm. upcoming U.S. election. And, and as you know, Caddy, you know, the U.S., carries such weight on the global stage as well. And President Biden delivered his swan song speech, his final speech um, to the assembly here. And you know, what got the, the loudest applause um, from the delegates is when he talked about knowing when to give up power and handing power to the next generation. And that was well received um, in that room. But was that a reference to himself or to all of the people in the room who have hung on to power for so long? Perhaps both. But it's, it was received well, so perhaps some self-reflection from some of the world leaders and delegates in the room. Yeah. But it seemed to be more of a reference to himself. Um, but what I found interesting is, you know, if you talk to people here, they don't seem that concerned by this massive upcoming U.S. election. Not that they're not concerned, but perhaps if I put it this way, uh, they have a sense that not that much will change. You know, we were speaking to NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, for example, and we've asked him this multiple times. But at the NATO summit uh, in July in Washington, you could feel there was more of a palpable concern. It was a time where President Biden felt um, in a weak position. Clearly, if you looked at the polls at the time, it was before he dropped out of the race. And it was a time where President Trump was uh, former President Trump was surging in the polls here because the race is so even and because obviously much of the discussion here is, is in the U.S. is based on domestic politics. Um, it's almost as if European leaders, um, delegates here, uh, ministers we've spoken to have a sense that whatever the outcome, it's not going to make that much of a difference. But, you know, I don't know, Caddy, if that's a sense that you get from some of your discussions as well with, with international yeah, that's sources. That's interesting. I mean, some of the people that I, you know, I spoke to a very senior European diplomat a while ago, a few months ago, and said, look, you know, uh, you know, tell me one good thing from your point of view if Donald Trump wins the election. And there was a kind of rather embarrassed pause and silence for a good 30 seconds. And then this diplomat burst out laughing and said, well, I can't offhand think of one. Um, so I think they're all kind of gearing themselves up for the reality. They know, as we all do, as Katrina was just saying, that the polls may or may not be reliable and that Donald Trump may well be reelected. I think a lot of people know it's interesting. I had a couple of conversations this week, actually, with economists um, who were saying, look, Donald Trump often says things that are extreme, like there'll be blanket tariffs on all imports or I don't see why we should carry on funding NATO, for example. But he doesn't actually necessarily always act on those things. And they point back to his first term in office where, you know, things actually, yes, it was rocky in terms of the noise. But in some ways, the substance was a lot of stuff that Europeans feel that they could deal with again. Um, so I, th I think there's just a lot of unknowns. I mean, you know, that I think my 
biggest takeaway from speaking to foreign diplomats here in Washington. I haven't spoken to as many foreign leaders as you've done this week, Sumi, but speaking to diplomats, which I do regularly here, is that they don't really know. They don't know whether this Trump 2.0 would be sort of similar to Trump 1.0 that they kind of feel they're just about managed to get to grips with, or whether it would be, you know, blanket tariffs and pulling out of NATO um, and rejecting, you know, other multilateral alliances. Uh, I think one thing that I have heard, and I don't know if you've heard this, is this phrase that's going around, which is that America first means Europe last, and that were Trump to get back in, he's he's not a great fan of Europe. Yeah, that is certainly a concern among European leaders and ministers we've been speaking to. Uh, you know, they may not say so explicitly, but you can hear that tone, uh, the concern that uh, you know, under President Biden, the relationship between European allies and the U.S. has improved dramatically. And they understand, of course, that that could change should Donald Trump be in the White House again. But speaking about multilateral institutions, again, with Ian Stoltenberg, you know, he delivered what seemed to be a bit of a, um, a veiled message, let's say, to Donald Trump when he told us, uh, my concerns, he's leaving his post, as you know, Caddy, and he said, my concerns are essentially that people may take NATO for granted. Now, as you said, Donald Trump did not pull the U.S. out of NATO, and there is no indication that he would do so. But of course, that relationship became a lot more contentious. I will say that we just um, also spoke to the Kenyan president. He said, look, we know Donald Trump as well. We work, had a good relationship with Donald Trump. We will have a good relationship with the U.S. Mm -hmm. because the um, foundation, let's say, of that relationship goes back so far and is so solid that not, no one administration can change it. So clearly a very you know, diplomatic answer from the Kenyan president, which is to be expected. He will have to work with either Donald Trump or Kamala Harris, whoever is next in the White House. But what I really think is remarkable here is there's some serious concern among U.S. delegates here, the U.S. delegation, about the escalating situation in Lebanon, you know, the, the escalating situation between Israel and Hezbollah, the concern that you know, another hot war could really derail Kamala Harris's campaign. And, you know, Katrina, you know, well, you were talking to voters in Michigan who are very critical of the U.S.'s position on Israel. Absolutely. And it's not just voters in Michigan, although obviously, as we discussed on last week's episode, Sumi, there is, you know, the highest concentration of Arab American and Muslim Americans in America in Michigan, which is a battleground state, is one of these states that moves between supporting Donald Trump and Kamala Harris and Definitely the vibe I got from voters there is that they are very, very unhappy with how Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have approached this conflict so far. And that's reflected in polling among general Democratic voters as well, who are very unhappy with how that situation has progressed. We were speaking to a lot of people from Lebanon. And of course, last week was the beginning of this phase, if you like, in terms of we'd seen those explosions of the pagers and various devices in Lebanon. And they were very concerned about where this would go and what that would mean for, you know, relations um, within the community. They're very concerned about their family members, their friends in Gaza, in Lebanon. And they feel that their tax dollars are going to the Department of Defense, which a portion of them are. And that's going to support Israel in this military campaign. And Interestingly, the uncommitted movement had said, you know, they couldn't endorse Kamala Harris, but they weren't prepared to endorse Donald Trump either. And they didn't they said they didn't want to see a Trump presidency either. And of course, just a few days ago, we saw the Democratic mayor of Hamtrak, which is one of the nearby cities to Detroit, also with a very heavy Arab and Muslim community actually endorsing Donald Trump. So if that conflict in Lebanon continues and I mean, you've been hearing it from the world leaders there, we've been hearing it for the last few days about the concern for regional spread. How how much is that going to play into how voters make their decisions? I think Katrina, as, what's the what's the latest polling on that? What's the latest polling on that? Because my the sort of general sense is that it's not as hot an issue. We're not seeing you know campuses have been back now a month. We're not seeing the same kind of protests on student campuses that we did see um, in during the course of all of last year, really. I haven't seen, I haven't checked recent polling on Gaza and how it plays and how much it ranks as an issue and particularly in Michigan. But when you were there, did you look at any of the data on this on whether people still feel that this is a determinative issue? 
It's very concentrated, Cathy. And I mean, talking about the college protests, those protests are continuing in certain campuses. There have been protests in the University of Michigan, for example, since term started. Students and protesters have been arrested there. So, But it's not getting the national coverage that it had been getting. And we're not seeing it in places like the universities in New York and in California, at least not in a large scale, the way we had before the end of the academic term. So again, when, the polling is determined by who you're talking to and where you're doing that sampling in those areas around Michigan. It is up there with economy and with inflation. And, and for some, it's slightly above it. In other parts of the country, it doesn't resonate at all. You know, Caddy, as I'm here in New York, I think you've been looking at what has been quite a bombshell story that's landed actually here in New York, but is resonating across the country, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, what a crazy story. Just when you thought this kind of political year couldn't get any more extreme, I did not have the mayor of New York City being indicted on five federal charges um, on my bingo card anyway. I mean, I guess this has been rumbling for a while. There have long been uh, discussions about corruption surrounding Eric Adams' um, bid for the, ma- for the mayor in 2021, his mayoral campaign. And he did have his telephone seized a while ago by the feds. But this week he was actually indicted on these charges of bribery, fraud and soliciting foreign campaign donations. Prosecutors gave an extraordinary press conference after they unsealed the indictment in which they kind of went through step by step uh, these business class flights, uh, luxury hotels that the mayor had been offered Uh, for free, basically, by the Turkish government in exchange for allowing the Turkish government to kind of have sort of waivers on uh, building construction safety permits. Eric Adams is alleged to have put pressure on New York City officials to allow the Turks to get their consulate open quickly um, in the city. He apparently he is alleged to have backed away from certain non-profit community, non-profit groups that the Turks didn't like. You know, obviously he has to go through a trial and there are big questions about whether he actually manages to stay in the mayor's office. He says none of this is true, that he's been a target, um, a political, it sounds, you know, actually, who else has said that they are the victim of political lawfare in America this year. Um, Sounds very like Donald Trump saying that I'm the target of this and it's all totally unjust and none of this is true and I'm not planning to step down. I've been in kind of contact with a couple of Eric Adams's um, supporters and donors over the last couple of days. And uh, one of them texted me today and said uh, that the mayor has to go for the good of New York City. But there, mm. this does, it's kind of interesting because it has mm. kind of ramifications beyond, I think, Eric Adams. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm not a New Yorker. And obviously the people of New yeah. York are going to have their own views about that. I mean, maybe you're sitting there, Sumi, and thinking the city is wonderfully run and that Eric Adams should well, stay and take credit. But I'm sure everyone has views I, about that today I don't know. on the streets They're- of New York. They sure do. And I can say I'm actually sitting right across, as you know, from the Turkish consulate, which is a pretty impressive building. <laughs> and uh, it's Excellent. shiny and and sparkling and new. And I'm, I'm hoping that I there can get go. over there and ask some questions. But it's pretty well secured because President Erdogan is here at the moment, as you know. But I'm really curious to see more about what is revealed through these charges, because it is remarkable to think, you know, Eric Adams is the you know mayor of the biggest city in America and clearly yeah. a very prominent figure it's in the huge. Democratic Party as well. It's a massive, massive story. It's the story. first and time that a New York mayor has ever been indicted on federal yeah. charges. In office. Yeah. Um, in yeah. off- and he, office. he is a person that people would have had on their bingo card as potential yeah. future Democratic presidential nominee as yeah. well. So, I mean, and again, he maintains his innocence here and he says he's fighting all these charges and it's weaponization of the justice system and so on. So we'll wait to see how all of that shakes out. But in terms of how it might impact the campaign, he was at an event with President Joe Biden last night. Uh, I see already there's sort of uh, statements coming out from within the White House that there was no interaction between them. He has rallied for Kamala Harris over the past few weeks as well, been with her at events. So it's interesting to see how in politics this race is so tight that people are your allies one moment and there's an indictment against you and they run to the other room to get away from you even before anything's been in a court. Like Senator Bob Menendez, of course, of New Jersey as well. And you know what I'm wondering, and and Katie, I don't know what you think about this, but, you know, Democrats have gone to great lengths to say, look, the fact that we've seen a Democratic senator indicted, now the Democratic mayor of New York City is proof that our justice system is not being weaponized against Donald Trump. Do you think that argument uh, holds water? 
Well, I'm already seeing Democrats saying, look, um, that Donald Trump's first national security advisor, the former General Michael Flynn, uh, actually pled guilty, admitted that he had been uh, working, lobbying on behalf of the Turkish government without and taking money from the Turkish government without declaring it. And he, of course, was pardoned by Donald Trump at the end of Donald Trump's presidency. And, and Democrats are making that comparison between the way that Donald Trump is treating uh, somebody on his side for exact, with exactly the same country in mind and the way that Democrats are treating, a, you know, a Biden under the Biden presidency, the DOJ has gone after Mayor Eric Adams, who, of course, is a Democrat. I think the more interesting question is what it means for the House of Representatives, because three of the most mm. competitive districts in the House, uh, which is going to be a big fight in November. We are so focused on Donald Trump and Kamala Harris that I think, you know, particularly for our audiences around the world, we forget that there is a lot of Senate races and House races as well. All of the House races are up. And three of the most competitive districts are actually in were won by uh, Republicans taken from Democrats. And they're in New York State and they're in Westchester County, Long Island. They're very close to New York City. And the, I think what's interesting is that Mayor Adams uh, can't be forced to go. He, he can be kicked out by the governor, Kathy Hochul, the Democratic governor. But if he decides to stay, it's very hard to see what the mechanism is. Even kind of getting Kathy Hochul to kick him out, it's never been done before. So that's a complicated process. But it's going to put the spotlight on the Democrats generally. It's going to put, put the spotlight particularly on Kathy Hochul. How does she deal with this? If this indictment, which... Most of the lawyers that I'm hearing at the moment are saying, listen, the New York City prosecutors would not have come up with this detailed an indictment unless they were pretty sure of what they had. If Kathy Hochul allows him to stay on as mayor of New York while he's fighting these charges, what does that mean for those three really competitive districts that Democrats want to get back from Republicans? And they were lost, many people thought, because voters around New York City were fed up with Kathy Hochul. They didn't like the Democratic leadership. They didn't like uh, the influx of immigrants that have come up. They didn't like prices and their brain. Congestion pricing. Congestion pricing. There's a lot of things they don't like about um, cost of living issues, even, you know, local issues and, and national issues as well. And so it will kind of put a spotlight on the Democrats on how they deal with Eric Adams. Sumi, you're in New York. I'll be in New York in a couple of days for the vice presidential debate, which is happening there in Manhattan on the other side to where you are now on Tuesday, when, of course, the Democratic VP pick, Governor of Minnesota, Tim Walz, takes on the Republican VP pick, the Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, in this vice presidential debate. It looks like it's going to be the last debate of uh, this cycle. It doesn't seem like there's going to be another presidential debate between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. So we'll all be keeping our eyes on that. And I suppose I've been kind of thinking about VP debates and how important they are or how unimportant they are, as the case may be. And it's interesting this time around that both Walls and Vance have relatively high profiles for vice presidential candidates. They've been garnering a lot of headlines for themselves along the way. Um, and probably this debate will have a lot more eyeballs on it than it usually would. I mean, often VP debates are where the actual substantive policy discussions take place because the two top candidates try and take pot shots at each other. And then for the VPs, it's less about arguing on um, past backgrounds because, of course, Harris and Trump have been in administrations before, Vance and Walls have not been. So I've been speaking to a few strategists from both campaigns as to what their kind of hopes and fears and dreams are for the debate on Tuesday. And from the Republican side of things, they're quite worried that J.D. Vance will be the word used to me was exposed as being young and immature. There's, you know, 20 plus age differential between Vance and Walls. Walls very experienced in these kind of arenas, having been a congressman for so many years and a two term governor as well. He's been through very many debates, not on a national or international stage, of course, but within his districts. Um, and J.D. Vance simply doesn't have that same level of experience. On the Democratic side of things, they're worried about uh, Tim Walz coming across as being sneery and looking mm. down on J.D. Vance. Mm. And, you know, a lot of the kind of gags that Walz is making about J.D. Vance, about hiding in his couch and so on, 
they're worried about how that will come across when you're in that very formal setting of a studio without an audience. There aren't laughs and applause coming back at you and that, you know, he might seem quite crass by comparison. So I'm just wondering, how do you guys think it's going to go on Tuesday? What are you going to be looking out for? Well, you know, I find it interesting that you say that the Democrat strategists are concerned that Tim Waltz might come across as sneering and perhaps looking down at J.D. Vance. Of course, he's the one who came up with the term weird when describing the Republicans, and that really stuck, didn't it? At the same time, you know, isn't it also part of his image that he's this middle-of-the-road Midwestern dad who has worked across the aisle several times in the past and is someone who can relate to the average voter, um, who doesn't represent, you know, the, the coastal elite, that criticism that we often hear of where Democrats are right now. So, I mean, Caddy, I don't know what you think, but it would, I would assume that they believe that Tim Walls actually can project better than, let's say, Kamala Harris on some of those um, issues and relating to people. So I, I think I'm interested in, first of all, who these two men are going to be trying to reach on Tuesday night, given that a vice presidential debate is not going to get the kind of audiences that we saw for a presidential debate. And I know that both campaigns are very, we're at that stage of the campaign where they're really kind of slicing and dicing the electorate. And who can Tim Walz appeal to that Kamala Harris has trouble appealing to? Who can J.D. Vance potentially, you know, make sure goes to the polls that perhaps Donald Trump might not manage to actually get to turn out and vote? So I think a lot of that, I, the, and I raise that because I think both of the campaigns are very focused on young men at the moment. And Walz is seen, it's, it's hard for Kamala Harris, who has been very careful not to talk about her gender, but it is sort of hard for her to go out and say, I am the candidate of young men. I mean, not, not as bluntly as that, but that's the problem that the Harris campaign is having at the moment. There, there's this is enormous gender gap. We've never seen a gender gap between young men and young women as wide as it is in this election campaign, which is great news for the Harris campaign in terms of getting young women to go to the polls. Women decide elections because they vote in bigger numbers in America, but they can't afford to lose all of those kind of 19 to 29 year old men who Donald Trump is making a real appeal to at the moment. And it's just gonna be interesting to me to see the kind of two versions, in a way, the two versions of masculinity that appear on that stage. And that's kind of what I'm going to be watching out for is Walls trying to kind of soften um, the kind of alpha male type view of masculinity that we've seen a bit of from J.D. Vance and from that we've seen of for years from Donald Trump. Or is he going to try and compensate for that by talking a lot about his time as a football coach? I mean, it's, an, it's a kind of very interesting role that he has to play. His role, I think, is more we kind of know what J.D. Vance is going to do and what he's going to say. I'm more interested in how Tim Walls tries to close this gender gap because the campaign knows that they are suffering with young men and what can they do to rectify some of that. And I think this is the chance they have because in a way, Tim Walls is the candidate, partly was chosen with those with young men in mind. That's why they keep calling him coach, right? I mean, that's, that's his role to some extent. His role is to be an attack dog, but his role in this particular campaign is also to try and reach young men that Harris seems to have difficulty reaching. And I think that matchup, given that both of them are from that district, those kind of similar districts in terms of Ohio and Minnesota, that middle of the country coming from similar ish kind of backgrounds that we'll see a very different type of conversation than we saw between Harris and Trump um, and sort of how that plays out. And, and of course, as you said, Cassie, you know, this is not about, you know, tens of millions of people tuning in. But at the same time, all of these things are about viral moments, aren't they? I mean, it's yeah. it's if they if they get out of the debate with it being boring, that will actually have been a win. If anyone actually clicks on any of those little bit, I don't think it is going to be boring, actually. I think this I is going to be either. a fun debate. I'm think... looking forward to this one because there's such different personalities. Something to talk about next week, ladies. I've got to run because Absolutely. they're just about to do a security sweep and I've got to pack up all of this equipment and get out of here. Get out so, of here. Okay. <laughs> Stay great dry, to talk to you. Okay. And we will, um, we'll see you okay. all next week. And thanks we'll for listening to the program. Yeah. And we'll see you again next week. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.